hey, didn't see you there. I've been dying to do that, like this whole series, as I sit here and struggle to figure out how to say hello in like 30 to 40 different ways. Hey y'all, welcome back. Happy Saturday, hope yours was good. So I've been thinking a lot lately because we sure do have the time, don't we? I've been thinking about entitlement and gratitude and uh, getting what we deserve and think we deserve and things that we feel we are owed because a lot of people seem to have a lot of talk lately about what we're owed as Americans during lockdown. I think we're owed the truth. I think we're owed support and strength fairness and kindness. I think that's what we're owed as Americans. That's a big deal for me. So the first story is going to be about two dogs. It's called The Dog's Life. Actually, it's a really cute dog. It's a very Toto looking dog. Once there lived a dog that had a happy life and the dog's name was Mott. Mott lived in a big house with all the food he could eat and he slept in a warm bed by the fireplace. And every day the old man who owned the house would come and sit with the dog and stroke his head and tell Mott of the places that he'd been doing, been during the day and who he'd visited. The man was a storyteller and made his living by traveling from village to village and making up special stories for the children. In return, the people gave him gold coins. The man used the coins to buy food and pay for his house. All of the best bits of food that he bought went to his faithful furry friend. To the man, his dog was not a pet, but a loyal and trusted friend. He looked forward to the time at the end of the day when he could share his food and his stories with his furry friend. But one day, while the man was away, Mott sat outside, and up walked a dog that he'd never seen before. She was the most beautiful creature that he had ever seen. While Mott was dark and scruffy, she was light and shiny. Her name was Mimi, and Mott fell instantly in love with her. When a man came home from his day's travels, he saw Mimi and he smiled and he made a bed by the fireplace for her and she and Mott curled up happily together. They lived happily for some time until one day, Mott noticed that Mimi was looking very angry. Whenever the man passed by her, she let out a low <laughs> sound. When the man left for the day, Mott asked her what was wrong. Mm, I don't like him. She growled. Mm -hmm. He has so much, but he only throws us the scraps from his table and he makes us sleep on the floor. And if he really loved us, he would build big beds for us and feed us from his table. Mott didn't know what to say. He had never thought of it this way before. He had always felt more like the man's son than his pet. But now listening to Mimi, he suddenly saw things differently. So that night, when the man came home and reached out to stroke Mott's fur, Mott pulled away and he growled. When he placed a foot in front of Mott, the dog knocked over the bowl, jumped up to the table, and ate the man's supper instead. The man was shocked. Then Mimi joined in and the two dogs growled and snarled at the man. When the man tried to calm the dogs, he, knocked, he was knocked down so hard that he lay there for a very long time. When he finally got up, there were tears in his eyes. He opened the door and using a broom, he shooed the dogs out of his house. The old man sat and stared into the fire, wondering what could have so upset the animals. For now, he saw them as animals not his friends. Well, said Mimi with pride, 
that should teach the man. He will never treat us so poorly again. No, he'll get lonely. And when we come back to scratch at his door, he'll take us in and treat us so much better. But Ma was not sure about Mimi's ideas anymore and he began to feel very sad and empty inside. After a few days passed, he looked in the window of the old man's house and he saw the old man was laying on his bed looking very sick. Mott remembered all the times the man had stroked his fur, fed him, told him stories. But Mimi came up to Mott and said, it's not time to scratch at the door yet. Mott turned around and said, grrr, at her. Look what we've done, he cried. The old man is sick at heart. He can't go out and tell his stories. He'll starve. Huh, who cares about him, she said. <laughs> he didn't love you. I love you. And now all you should care for is me. With those words, Mott realized that Mimi had been greedy. Also, she was jealous of his friendship with the old man. Mimi, he said, you are my new friend and I love you. But that does not mean I cannot love my old friends as well. The old man has truly been good to me and I must go to him. Mimi was angry and she said she would leave and never come back. This made Mott sad, but he knew how much the old man needed him. Come or go as you like, said Mott. I will always be here to love you and feed you just as the old man has been here for me, but I must be true to my old friend. Mimi went to the window and looked in. She saw the old man lying beneath the covers, looking very sad. And suddenly she knew she'd been terribly wrong. She had never had a friend like him. She realized that she had been jealous of the kind way that he treated Mott. Okay, you go to him and I'll gather some wood for the fire, she said, because he must be cold. Mott ran to the door of the house and he barked and he scratched and he jumped until the old man finally got out of bed and answered his calls. When he saw Mott, the old man was afraid that the dog might attack him again. Then Mott came and he stood very close to the man and he stood very, very still. The man smiled and he stroked the dog's fur. When the man sat by the fireplace, the dog brought him a blanket and curled up beside him. When Mimi scratched at the door, the old man let her in. She placed the sticks by the fire. And then, feeling badly about how she would behaved, she turned to leave. But the old man called her back. He stroked her fur and he said kind words to her. Then he went to the cupboard and he pulled out two beautiful wooden bowls. One said Mott and the other said Mimi. And he placed them at a dog-sized table beside his own and invited the dogs to dine. They all ate and were happy ever after, while the old man told his stories again. Now, a friend of mine named Powell pointed out to me last night that when he first started watching these story times, he expected them to be children's stories. And these are children's stories. They're just a little higher level children's story, but he did make me think that we did need to feather in maybe some of the picture books. And I just so happen to have one that pairs nicely with uh, the concept of entitlement and what we expect from people. So this is a new book that just came out a year ago for Virginia's 400th anniversary. And it's gonna of course be totally backwards for you guys because I'm using the back camera because then I can see what I'm doing. It's called America the Grateful where Thanksgiving really began. So we're gonna read this old school way with the pictures and everything from start to finish. Hey, Grady. And what you also should know is that the children in these pictures, these illustrations done by Severa Meyer, Lippold of South Africa. Hey. These are all kids who are local to Norfolk. They're in my chess program. And they have all been translated, transmogrified. And there's an opening here. So this book has an interesting backstory. 
and I'm telling a backstory. Why? Because I can. I've written two books now about how Virginia was the site of the first Thanksgiving, not Plymouth, Massachusetts. And the first one was a lot more fun story than the second one. We're not telling the second story. It's not fun. Great book, not a fun story. But the first one had a pig pardon. Yeah, because your girl here just thought the best way to get media attention with no budget was to get a pig, a piglet, name her Ginny after Virginia, and then have the President of the United States, George W. Bush at the time, pardon her in the Rose Garden for Thanksgiving. That was my plan. And I found a way to utilize bots. Yep. So every time we got someone to sign this petition, these bots would send every single senator, every single congressman, and every member of the White House staff, because you could still do this stuff back then a couple years ago, um, an email asking for W to pardon a pig. And I got a phone call one night from George W. Bush's personal assistant, actually his chief of staff, he called me at home right here, Norfolk. And I was pretty amazed and um, White House operator put me through and this man had a temper on him. And he said, no, no, the president of the United States is not going to pardon a pig. Do you understand me? It's not happening. It's not happening. And I said, well, I think it should happen. And he said, you're nobody. Do you understand that? You are nobody. This is not happening. I said, well, sir, with all due respect, if I'm nobody, why are you, the White House Chief of Staff, calling me a nobody mom in Norfolk, Virginia, at nine o'clock at night to remind me that I'm a nobody? I think the only one you're trying to convince here is me, and I think that he needs to go pardon a pig. And if he doesn't do that, I'm gonna keep sending them emails. And so he gathered himself and said, what's it gonna take for him to not do that? And I said, well, he'd have to come fly to Virginia and show up at uh, Berkeley Plantation for the Virginia Thanksgiving and admit that this was the location of the first Thanksgiving. That's the only other option. He said, no. And I said, okay, well, you have yourself a good night. And then I got a call the next morning that that was gonna be happening. So I went, uh, with my boys, with um, Zoltan and Ian and Avery. And uh, we went to Berkeley Plantation. There's a whole row of chairs right there, like third row. And it said Suhey family on it. And Marine One helicopter landed and W got off and he gave this lovely speech and all. But they made sure to keep me far away from him. And I wanted to meet him. So I took the boys and I went down front and center and I waited in line with the others who were supposed to be meeting him. And I, uh, I shook his hand and I said, well, you know, it's so good to meet you. So glad you're here. I said, but it's a shame that you couldn't pardon Ginny. And at that point, the White House Chief of Staff materialized like right in front of me and stood between me and the president and said, sir, we need to move along. He went, Ginny, who is Ginny? And they're trying to hustle him along and all of a sudden George W. Bush stops. And he has this massive epiphany. He goes, oh, the pig. Oh my God, I love that. Why couldn't we pardon that pig? I think we should have pardoned the pig. Where's the pig lady at? Where's she? She's great. Come here, come here. And he grabbed me by the shoulder. President George W. Bush grabbed me by the shoulders and he proceeded to do the following thing. He headbutted me. Yes, he did. With just, he went bunk, 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 three times, forehead, forehead, and then said, that was a great idea. I loved it, made me laugh. Good work, great pig. And he gets back on Marine One and he flies away. And we're walking away. And my son Ian just cannot process what he has just seen cannot process it. And he's probably like, you know, second grade at the time. And he is stopping absolutely everybody he sees. And we're right in front of the press bullpen. 
TV cameras standing and everybody. And he's yelling at the top, my mom got headbutted by the president. My mom just got headbutted by the, and all of a sudden, we're surrounded by the Secret Service. And the Secret Service are now surrounding Ian and taking him away. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. And so it was like Slugworth in uh, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. He's like, this guy is leaning down and he's saying to Ian, son, what you saw just now was not a headbutt. It was the presidential forehead touch. And it is what the president bestows upon people whom he likes and respects. What was it? And I'm like, Ian, so help me, just say it. And Ian's like, it was the presidential forehead touch that he gives to people that he really likes and respects. And the Secret Service said, thank you. And Ian waited till they got in their cars. And then he ran up to the first Associated Press reporter he could find and started shouting, my mom just got headbutted by the president. And so, yeah. And then, of course, on the, in the car on the way home, he was also explaining to me how um, if I didn't wash my forehead, there was DNA there, we could clone them and make them better somehow. So this was a long process. And this is why I was surprised when the folks at Berkeley Plantation came back to me two years ago and asked me to write another book. Who'd have thunk it? Well, Warren Stewart would have thunk it. That's why that happened. So I decided that if I was going to write a book about a plantation, because they wanted the whole history of the plantation, that what I really needed to do was teach people the basic history, children the basic history, but I wanted to go a step further and I wanted to teach them about gratitude. And I think that right now, whether or not it's actually Thanksgiving, that now is a great time to think about this book and this story. So, America the Grateful, where Thanksgiving really began. Someone call the president. We've got to set the record straight on everything about Thanksgiving from the date to what they ate. Urgent call for the president. Yes, this is this president. Hang on tight. Here's a tale that's right. You're in for quite a shock. The first day of thanks happened in Virginia. Not Plymouth Rock. Ooh, I love her, I love her art. It wasn't in November, turkey wasn't on the table. They ate ham, oysters, and anything they were able. Because this is how we children's authors were. On December 4th, 1619 at Berkeley Plantation, settlers celebrated arriving at their new nation. Yeah, you see where we had some problems, right? Their meal wasn't like the ones we do today. Nobody watched a parade or a football team play. They didn't do much cooking. What they really did was pray. Captain John Woodleaf got orders from Berkeley Company for settlers to all gather round and give thanks on bended knee. Here's the original proclamation. Well, not the original proclamation. They gave thanks to God for their safe trip across the stormy sea. But today, we can say thanks for many things in a land where we're all free. For those of you on your phones. Thanks for neighbors of every creed and color, for friends and family. Thanks for teachers who set us straight. Thanks for firefighters who are never late. Thanks for every happy minute. Thanks for a kitchen with food in it. Thanks for everything we've got, even when it's not a lot.
It doesn't matter if we're eating to turkey or tofu. As long as we've got the freedom to be me and you, from shore to shore, let's make gratitude more of what this holiday celebrates across our nation, just like they did at Berkeley Plantation. If we focus on an attitude of gratitude, the mood, not the food, then from fall to fall, we can share an America that is both beautiful and grateful for all. Yeah. I think, I think that an attitude of gratitude is absolutely the way to go. It's all about our mood right now. Sometimes it's a little bit about the food. But in lockdown, when we don't know what we're gonna find at the store tomorrow, when we're cooking cakes without flour and starting to grow our own tomatoes for the first time in a while, some of us, it's an attitude of gratitude. And I'm so grateful to my friend for reminding me that there are a couple other children's books here in the arsenal that I still need to read to you. Thank you so much for being here and I'll see you all again tomorrow night.